much. Um, so I am Mark O'Connell. Um, there's more. Um, <clears throat> I'm the author of this book, To Be a Machine, which is, uh, has, has been pointed out about um, transhumanism, basically, which is this um, movement kind of predicated on the idea that we can and should use um, technology to sort of push out the boundaries of the human condition, to sort of uh, push out our limitations and to become ultimately immortal through technology. Um, so it is, it's very much a book about technology, but I'm also um, a person who would not necessarily read this book. I'm not a science writer. I'm not a big science person particularly. Um, my sort of uh, background is in is in literary criticism. I have a PhD in English literature, but I've always been really fascinated by by stories, by um, art and mythology that kind of um, gets to the root of like the strangeness of, of being human, um, of, of our kind of inability to accept um, our animal nature. I'm really sort of fascinated by that and I've always been fascinated, um, even though I didn't grow up in a sort of religious uh, setting and I didn't have much kind of contact with religion growing up, I was always really fascinated by uh, the story of the fall, the kind of the first book of the Bible, Adam and Eve and the serpent and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just think that's the most amazing story, the most amazingly kind of um, profound and poetic and in a way true sort of statement of our inability to accept our kind of animal nature, our own um, sense that we're, that our nature is kind of unnatural to us in a way. And I think it's this really weird, um, beautiful way of, of putting that. So in a way, my sort of fascination with transhumanism uh, kind of links in with that and kind of grows out of that same sort of set of uh, concerns. Um, but so uh, I guess my initial, kind of, I should say a bit about sort of why I came to this topic as someone who doesn't really know anything about science and doesn't, is not really particularly interested in science other than this book about science that I happen to write. Um, <clears throat> so if you don't give a damn about science, you're in good company. Um, yeah, hopefully you're in good hands. Um, but so, yeah, about just over four years ago now, um, I became a parent for the first time. And um, there was something about the experience of, along with the sort of the joy of early parenthood, um, there was something about the experience that made me sort of obsessed with mortality, actually, and obsessed with the kind of fragility of, of um, our kind of animal condition. And I started to think about all this stuff again, and I started to think about um, the story of the fall. And I also started to read a lot about transhumanism. I sort of found out about this movement that suggested that we could um, transcend this condition. And I think what happened was probably what a, a psychoanalyst might call a process of sublimation. I kind of took these anxieties that I had and sort of plowed them into this obsession with this, with this movement. And that's one of the kind of sweet deals, I think, about being a writer is that you can take um, anxieties and make them into something productive. And I think that's part of uh, what this book has been about for me, although it is about it is about transhumanism and it is about artificial intelligence and the prospect for immortality and all that kind of stuff. It's also about a lot of other things as well, um, namely my own kind of anxiety about, about mortality and death. Um, but so one of the first things uh, that I did for the book in terms of reporting was I went to this place in Phoenix in Arizona called Alcor Life Extension Foundation. And uh, Alcor is the largest of uh, the world's four cryonics facilities. And for people who don't know what cryonics is, cryonics is essentially the science, or probably more accurately, pseudoscience of um, preserving recently deceased human bodies with a view to, at some point in the future, maybe 50 years from now, maybe 500 years from now, when the technology becomes sophisticated enough, bringing those bodies back to life, sort of thawing them and reconstituting them and bringing them back to life. Um, and so this is obviously a, a pretty sort of far out, pretty speculative I idea. Um, but one of the things that sort of fascinated me, I guess maybe because I'm not a science-y person, I became really preoccupied with the, ben like the, the sort of juxtaposition between um, the, the sort of vaulting sci-fi aspirations of this place and the absolute banality of it as well. Um, it's in this, it's essentially in a, an industrial estate outside Phoenix and it's, it's sort of sandwiched between um, a place called Big D's Floor Covering Supplies and a tile showroom. Uh, and it's just a really squat gray block of a building. So I became really sort of fascinated by that sort of the juxtaposition of that. Um, so there's quite a lot of that kind of stuff in the book as well. But um, so I was taken on a, a tour of the facility and um, the first thing that is explained to you when you go on a tour of this place is um, what happens to the bodies, what happens to the, what they call them patients, because within the logic of cryonics, uh, 
these bodies are not actually dead. Um, they're just suspended is the term, and, and uh, they're in a kind of a liminal stasis between life and death, so you have to be very careful to refer to them as, as patients. Um, but what happens is essentially the, the bodies are um, perfused with a kind of a cocktail of chemicals, and essentially antifreeze is what they use to prevent the breakdown of, um, of cells. So basically your body is pumped with antifreeze. Um, in most cases, actually, that doesn't happen, though, because in most cases, you're simply beheaded. Um, for two reasons, really. Um, the first one is that it's much cheaper to, just for reasons of storage, basically, to store a head um, than it is to store an entire body. It'll cost you, I think, I think it's 200 grand it costs to get your entire body, usually paid for with um, insurance. Uh, but it costs 200 grand to preserve your entire body and 80 grand for the head, so it's a much more reasonable option. Um, <laughs> But the other reason is that transhumanists typically are not interested in coming back to life in 50 years from now or 1,000 years from now or whatever in their uh, decrepit old bodies that they sort of lived their entire lives and died in. They want, um, what they want to happen is um, to, for the heads to be um, unfrozen and the brain to be removed and the mind to be scanned and uploaded to a machine. And the idea is that you sort of live out eternity or, you know, a thousand years or whatever in the body of a, like a robot or whatever other substrate you might want to, uh, to be contained in. So this is obviously pretty far out stuff, um, but the, one of the people who um, has signed up to be um, preserved at Alcor is uh, a Silicon Valley futurist named Ray Kurzweil. Um, Kurzweil is the director of engineering at, at Google. And he was hired by the Google founders to be a kind of a, a technological visionary. And he wrote this book called uh, the singularity is near, um, which is about this idea of the technological singularity. And this is kind of an article of faith for transhumanists. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of transhumanists, obviously, when I was writing the book, and eventually all of them would come to some or other version of this idea of the singularity. And it's the idea, essentially, is that at a certain point in the sort of uh, near to medium future, artificial intelligence will get to such a degree of uh, sophistication and it will become so powerful that we will be able to upload our minds to machines and sort of merge ourselves with artificial superintelligence and become uh, kind of uh, disembodied floating um, intelligences without bodies who, who won't die. Um, and it's, it's obviously quite extreme and quite radical, but there, the thing that I've found out quite quickly is that Silicon Valley is full of people who, who think in this way and think that this is... Um, at least a kind of a theoretical possibility uh, for our future. And so uh, one of the people who I uh, spent some time with for the book uh, is a guy called Randall Kuhne, um, who's Dutch, but who um, has lived and worked in Silicon Valley for a while now, where these kinds of ideas are, um, as he put it, people are less likely to back away from you at a party if you mention that you work on brain uploading, which is what he does. <clears throat> and uh, he's a computational neuroscientist, and uh, his whole sort of life's work has been sort of figuring out the parameters and the possibilities for how this might be done, how you might extract a consciousness from the substrate of the brain. This is the term that they use, the substrate. Um, so the idea is that a human mind is, is like a software, and it's run on the hardware of, of the brain. Uh, and so, you know, theoretically, it could be extracted from that hardware and run on a different kind of hardware. Um, so there's a, a real kind of... Um, uh, a sort of computational view of what it means to be human. Um, and there's a, you hear a lot of language from transhumanists that I, I found sort of viscerally unpleasant. Um, there's uh, a quote from um, a guy called uh, <clears throat> Marvin Minsky, who's uh, a sort of fairly um, significant figure in the history of artificial intelligence. He's seen as one of the father figures of artificial intelligence. Uh, and he um, comes out with this pretty horrific quote, I think, um, the human brain happens to be a meat machine, is how he puts it. And so I kept seeing versions of this kind of language uh, when I was researching the book and when I was talking to people. I, uh, I was um, speaking to a, a, a computer engineer who's, um, who left Google quite recently and who um, works in a futurist think tank in Berkeley called the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And we were talking about sort of his dreams of the singularity and you know how it might be possible and the sort of fears and anxieties that go along with it. And he said this thing to me that just struck me as the most extraordinary thing. He sort of pointed at his head and went, right now, 
the only way you can run a human being is on this quantity of meat. And he was talking about his own brain. And so I just thought it was the most extraordinary language, like run a human being, like we are software, we are kind of algorithms. And so that's part of transhumanism is this idea that we are already machines and we just need to become sort of more sophisticated, better machines. Um, so obviously there's some uh, serious kind of questions around the scientific viability of this stuff. Most neuroscientists would tell you that, well, to put it mildly, it's a very kind of remote possibility. Um, I did speak to some scientists who felt that it was theoretically possible uh, and even some who thought that it was worth um, striving for. Um, but what I found sort of really compelling was the philosophical questions around this stuff. Um, in particular, would it be you if you could sort of, if you could um, succeed in sort of scanning your mind and uploading yourself to a robot, would that, would that sort of scanned mind be you or would it be kind of, uh, you know, an identical mind twin or something like that? And uh, one of the people who I spent time with was um, a guy called Tim Cannon, who uh, thinks of himself and calls himself a cyborg. He runs this um, company called Grindhouse Wetware in, in Pittsburgh. And they design, him and his colleagues, they design and build um, technologies for implanting under the skin. Um, the idea is that these technologies would give you sort of superhuman capabilities. Um, in reality, they're sort of very mildly superhuman capabilities. Um, things like the ability to sense magnetic north or um, open a door with a gesture of your hand or whatever. Stuff that you could probably do with a key or a, an iPhone um, without having like unlicensed surgery or whatever. But the part of it for them is that it's a, a gesture towards this future of like post-human kind of existence. Um, one of the guys I um, talked to, there was a, a young engineer called Marlow who had a, um, a chip in his hand that would allow him access to the, to the laboratory, but he hadn't, he hadn't got security clearance yet, so the chip is sort of <laughs> lying there, so he's sort of like the world's worst cyborg in a way. Um, <clears throat> but um, so I, I sort of talked with these people, and they're, they're all men. Um, transhumanism is an overwhelmingly male kind of preoccupation, and so sort of, I felt as though I was, in a way, writing a book about men, like what's, what's, what's going on with men, um, in a way that I also felt that I was writing a book about like America and, and capitalism and all these other things. But yeah, I sort of, I want to have my cake and eat it, I want my book to be about everything. Um, but so I would talk about this stuff with them and, and um, this question of like, would it, would it be you? Um, in what sense would this like uploaded mind actually be you? And one of the things Tim, Tim Cannon said to me was that like every eight years, your body completely regenerates all of its cells. And so you're literally not the same person as you were eight years ago in terms of like you're a different organism. There's nothing that you have in common with yourself eight years ago. Um, so I thought that was a pretty extraordinary idea. And, and his point was that, well, it's the same ontologically speaking. It's the same idea as, you know, mind uploading. Um, it turns out it's not actually true. Um, <laughs> There's a part of your brain that, that the cerebral cortex in which the neurons survive. So the analogy that I <clears throat> kind of came to was that you're not, initially I thought it was like you're, you're a, uh, a rock band that is, you know, no original members but still touring under the same name. Like the Sugar Babes is a, is a really classic example of that apparently. Uh, but it turns out you're more like Fleetwood Mac and your cerebral cortex is, is Mick Fleetwood. Um, <clears throat> anyway, as they say, I'm not a science person. So. Um, but yeah, so like the thing that I kept kind of um, coming up against in the book was the kind of, the very strong religious subtext um, of all of this. Um, and transhumanists don't really have much truck with, with this conversation. They're aware that it's very easy to make comparisons between transhumanism and religion, but they're sort of uncomfortable with it because they're very extreme rationalists and they don't like any suggestion that these ideas have come up before, this idea of like separating the mind from the body and the soul and dualism and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think for me, transhumanism grows out of the same cluster of anxieties and fears as, as so many major religions um, do. Um, it just so happens that technology is kind of the vector of these hopes rather than, rather than a god, but it is, <clears throat> I would not say that it is a religion, but it, it certainly kind of comes from the same place. Um, and so I came to see transhumanism as a kind of an extreme manifestation of 
our culture's faith in technology is a vector of, of progress, um, as the belief that technology will save us from our own nature and return us to the um, kind of prelapsarian condition from which we were, were expelled. Thanks. That's, that's it.